Glad to see everybody here. Happy to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Ha Wen. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And I live, work, and play on the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish and Puyallup tribes. And I also have the wonderful pleasure of serving as the director of the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office here at the State Board, uh, the first of its kind. And uh, the ED or Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office runs lead on the policy guidance and implementation support for Senate Bills 5227 and 5194. Uh, so welcome to uh, some of the work that we are doing to deliver some of that policy guidance to our system of 34 colleges as today we talk about the faculty diversity program and showcase some of the good work at some of our uh, colleges across our state. So would like to also take just a couple of minutes to introduce my uh, team members on the EDI team. That is Melissa Williams and Christina Pleasants, as well as our state board colleagues, uh, Julie Huss, our HR director, and Dr. Claudine Richardson, our esteemed policy associate with the student success team. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, send it off to you, Melissa and Christina, introduce yourself as well as um, Julie and Claudine afterwards. Sure, thank you. My name is Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her, and I am uh, living and working in Vancouver, Washington, which is the traditional territories of the Cowlitz and the Chinook. Um, and I am policy associate for equity, diversity, and inclusion at the state board. I'm about four months into the role. Uh, and before that, I worked at Clark College for several years. I'm glad you all could make it. I'll turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Melissa. My name is Christina Pleasance. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the administrative assistant uh, for this department. And like Melissa, I've been here about five months and we've just been hitting the ground running and we are a small but <laughs> mighty team. So thank you for being here and I'll pass it on to Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Huss. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am the director of HR at the state board. And I will turn it on over to Claudine. Hello, and good morning, everyone. <clears throat> See a raspy voice. <laughs> um, my name is um, Claudine Richardson. I serve as the policy associate for Guided Pathways in the Strategic Initiatives and the Student Success Center. And I reside in Spokane for the Spokane Tribe. And I'm just so happy to be here and to grow and learn with all of you. Great. Thank you, team. I will go ahead and hand it back to Melissa before we start uh, the policy content and guidance of this meeting. I'd like Melissa to uh, go ahead and give a land and labor acknowledgement. Yes, happy to do that. And this is our current uh, land acknowledgement and um, we want to in full transparency, uh, let everyone know that we are working on this acknowledgement to make it more uh, a more collaborative process um, with uh, in our indigenous colleagues and communities. And so for now, this is what we have uh, and it is in flux. Um, but this is um, uh, what we'll start with today and the land acknowledgement for our agency reads. SBCTC acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin peoples. We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the native peoples across our good state. We also have a, land, a labor acknowledgement. Uh, we also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited and profited from the free enslaved labor of black people. We recognize the entangled and interconnected histories of indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and the plight of the black people who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the Af African diaspora and lift up the contributions, talents, and dreams of black communities. Importantly, we also acknowledge the immigrant and refugee labor that has contributed to the building of this country within our labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their important contributions to our good state and to this nation. Great. Thank you, Melissa. 
Uh, so I am going to do just a really quick overview, as many of you are aware and have, uh, may have attended our uh, January Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion info sessions uh, related to 50, uh, Senate Bill 5194, uh, recent legislation uh, that required that all community tech colleges uh, submit on a biennial basis beginning this July 2022 uh, DEI strategic plans to the State Board for Achieving Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion um, on their campuses. Embedded within uh, section three of this plan is the requirement for the State Board to provide guidance on uh, a model diversity program designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of faculty from all racial, ethnic, and cultural uh, backgrounds. And the faculty diversity programs uh, developed on the colleges must also be based on proven practices um, in diversity hiring processes. So what we worked, uh, the EDI office at the State Board uh, worked collaboratively uh, with uh, Julie Huss and her team in the HR office to develop guidance to support you and your work as you develop your own faculty diversity program on your own campus. And so uh, you'll see there a link to the faculty diversity model template. We also have a Google Drive of information that includes uh, resources such as this. So this is the guidance that is coming from our office to help support the development of your program. It provides a blueprint to assist with this development which is again, a key component in the DEI strategic plans, which all colleges will have to be submitting this July of 2022. Uh, we also built this template um, off of elements of the workforce diversity plan, which each college should have submitted uh, back in December, 2020. And I'll go ahead and hand it off to Julie to talk a little bit more about that requirement and submission uh, per directive 2002. Uh, Directive 2002 was something that came out of the governor's office and it was asking all state agencies in higher ed to create a plan around workforce diversity. Uh, OFM, State Office of Financial Management and State HR had created a template that uh, agencies and colleges could use to develop this plan and it really highlighted a lot of the work that uh, many of us were already doing within our institutions. And because it talked about things that we were already doing, we decided to um, use that template as a basis for this work as well, so that we weren't necessarily duplicating efforts and making sure that the work was feeding into each other, um, because the stuff already existed somewhere. So some of you may be familiar with that document, um, others may not be, but um, if you ask your HR folks or your uh, diversity folks on your campus, then um, they very likely were involved in some of the work around that. And part of that directive, it talked about, um, you know, reviewing policies, um, looking at what trainings you were doing on your campus, looking at your data and what your plan was for reviewing data and how you were going to um, consider that data. Um, and plans for how you were going to move forward with this work. So that's kind of the gist of what was in Directive 2002, and that was sort of the basis in which we built the, um, the template for the uh, legislation around. Okay, great, thanks, Julie. Oh, check to see if I'm on mute, I'm not. Uh, thanks, Julie. So as colleges continue to consider how to build out this body of work, wanted to make sure that these strategies continue to dovetail with the good work that Dr. Claudine Richardson is leading within our Astute Success Center uh, around the Guided Pathways Framework and Initiatives. I'd like to give Claudine some time uh, to talk a little bit about that work and how um, the critical opportunity that colleges have at this moment to be able to ensure that it is aligned with this uh, broader state initiative. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Oh my gosh. So I, as a employee at the State Board, I really don't get to see that many faces. <laughs> and so I would first like to dovetail and saying, can I see your faces if you're so willing? I would really love to go ahead and see who's present here. <laughs> and I would really love you to be able to acknowledge yourself in this space, because in higher ed, we are essentially a community. We are a family. And so when I see your faces, you give me what's called animo. 
you know, you fill my alma, you fill my soul. And so I want to know that you're here. I want to see your waves. I want to see your smiles. I want to see um, the hope or the reality that is, is your daily reality um, as you go through higher education. I always tell people there is no template. <laughs> there's no, there's, there's, there's no real template for how we do EDI work. We do our best work. We bring our, our full authentic selves into the space. And then we begin to think about the experiences and the stories we've heard from students in each other and how we can carry those in a spirit of collaboration and honor in history to improve the future, not just for our students, but also for our colleagues. I was so impressed when Ha um, started having conversations with me about how do we sync this work together? There are a lot of things on the table and it could be very, very confusing. And let's be honest, for some of us, it's emotionally taxing because we think about this, not just our work times, we think about this all the time. And so Ha was very much like, okay, how can we merge these conversations, how can we connect the thread that weaves it through that makes the beautiful fabric of how each of us can contribute and inviting me in as the guided pathways policy associate. And so many of you are familiar with that bill and I'm always confused the numbers HB 2158 that speaks to you know, the guided pathways work and its connection to equity and some of you may have seen. Um, the Student Success Institute agenda for this upcoming um, spring. And a lot of people were like, well, this is a different turn. And it's a different turn because someone said, if you want different results, you have to try something different. We can't continue on the path of trying to do the same things to try to address the concern. A couple of years ago in 2017, and then we saw research in 2012, we saw research in 2002, and then more recently in, in 2020, um, there was a direct connection between the experiences of students, faculty, and staff. And in that research, they noted that while there were pockets that could be addressed at a student level or a faculty level, we're really asking our BIPOC community members and our non-BIPOC community members who live at various intersections of primary and secondary identities to go ahead and support our students when sometimes they too may be struggling with how to connect and be successful in their roles. President Michael Bastin at the 2021 Fall Guided Pathways Institute says, just as we're developing a roadmap for our students on how to be successful from inquiry to completion slash promotion, it's critically important that we are able to mirror that for our faculty and staff members because they're the ones that not just do the subscribe work, as you know, you know what's in your job description and, and everything else that I might add on <laughs> as your supervisor, but also recognizing that they also do the invisible work, the work that no one can account for, subscribe for, the work that cannot be count, quantified um, in a job description. And so when campuses said, we are, how do we focus on this when we are having difficulty with looking at enrollments, I had to take a pause and think back to the research, not just indicating that doing this work is a moral imperative, but also that connection that said doing this work is also an instructional imperative of how we move forward our EDI efforts, recognizing that once our faculty and staff feel that they have a space at the table and their voices can be shared at the table and the comfort that sharing their voices, they will be heard at the table they are more likely to share the things that we have not done that could be done to support our students and how they are doing such. Um, recently, I think in a 2021 article that, that occurred during the pandemic, they said that when we think about the diversification of faculty and staff in higher education, it accounts 
for 35% of innovation, it creates 35% of growth, it supports 35% of community. And then when we couple that with the intersections of the primary identities, as well as the adjacent identities, um, according um, to Marie's diversity wheel, it triples. And so I want to thank you for, for being here today to be willing to grow and learn. I want to thank you for the amazing efforts happening across the space. And I also, I'm going to read, literally, I'm going to read these. I want to go ahead and share a couple of elements that the research has proven a need for consideration that cannot necessarily be quantified. Because for many of us, we rely strongly on the quantification of our EDI efforts, rather than sometimes the subtle messages of our EDI efforts. So one says, how do we ensure we are not centering a singular experience on our campuses? How do we make sure we think about how the person will be labeled coming into a space when they speak for their tone, tack, or volume that does not subscribe to the cultural norm? How will we act and encourage a person to show up as an individual, recognizing that in relational leadership and social identity leadership, they're also part of a collective and how we see them influences future hiring. How do you ensure you give them access to the right people so they are not siloed, so they do not feel like they are in a vat? How do you ensure they can access the right opportunities for their growth and their success? These questions ensure that we are serving a team, ensure that we are ensuring and supporting our EDI efforts, and also ensure that we are practicing. So when we take actions to support our students, we have these measures in mind. Um, so thank you for your time and enjoy your amazing day. Thank you, Claudine. It's it's so easy to come behind you because all I have to say is echo, echo, echo everything that you just said. <laughs> but thank you for uh, amplifying, lifting um, the critical um, aspects of this particular component of 5194. Um, I also appreciate how you are weaving that within the Guided Pathways initiative, calling attention to the importance of that as well beyond um, simply taking a peek at the support of students, not that that's a simple process by any means, but elevating it to our faculty and staff as well. So this is a really wonderful opportunity to come together and collaborate on that work. I just also want to lift up your work for the upcoming Student Success Institute in April, which you'll be also uh, elevating uh, individuals within our system as well on this uh, same body of work. So appreciate you. And with that, I want to have the um, chance to introduce, I think, Summer. I think I saw Summer come into the screen. Summer Course, are you there? I maybe I didn't see her come into the screen, but I, I think what I'll do is uh, introduce the other two facilitators um, who will be part of the College Highlights uh, Showcase portion of this event, and that is uh, Ilder Badencourt Lopez from Pierce College, and Fort Stillicum, and uh, Bonnie Glantz from Spokane Falls Community College. And of course, you heard me do a call out for summer course from Highline. I think she'll be here in just a, a minute or two. She's uh, being pulled in two different directions today, so we really appreciate her making the time to, to be with us to share a little bit about what Highline Highline is engaging in in regards to developing their faculty diversity program. I'm seeing a couple of chats. I'm going to see if there's a question here. Is it possible to list these questions in the chat? Uh, yes, feel free to do that. Kim from T Kim Flack from Tacoma. Yes, that's great. I think we'll just stall just a second. I'm going to check time here. It looks like we are right on 
time with what we've got listed. Looks like Summer's joined us now. Oh, that's perfect. Summer, we've been waiting with bated breath for you. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thanks for being with us. I let them know that you're being pulled in a couple of different directions oh, today. So appreciate you. No, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this uh, important work. We're really excited to implement the um, provisions of this House bill. It's really given a lot of strength be behind, I think, efforts that have been that I've been working on for many, many years from the time I was a graduate student at the University of Washington. So to see it uh, institutionalized in this way is really exciting. When I began this work 15 years ago, we were still trying to convince committees that you wouldn't sacrifice excellence by bringing more underrepresented candidates um, into your search pool. And to think that now we can talk about these sorts of things in the context of fit and merit as being racialized um, concepts is we've come a long way. So that that's wonderful that this is where we're at now. All right, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. I'm Summer Gorse, I'm the Executive Director of Human Resources at Highline College. Um, this year we implemented our first bias literacy training. This was a, I think we did it for two hours. We offered it to all of our search committees at once. Um, we have 13 active faculty recruitments this year with a couple more that I think might be trickling in later in the season. So at this bias literacy training, we discuss the competencies. Um, we discuss competencies in the recruitment process that are equity minded and reflect on the consequences of racialized evaluation criteria. So again, fit and merit. We encourage dialogue about implicit biases and the conceptions of fit and merit. As you all know, these are common criteria or phrases that we hear in higher education around faculty recruitments. And these criteria have historical implications that are racialized and not objective. Um, before the training, participants were asked to read about the reproduction of whiteness in faculty search processes, and they were also asked to watch a series of videos about implicit bias. They also took the Harvard implicit bias test, and at the training, we had breakout sessions where we encouraged conversation amongst the group, and then also in small teams where they could really talk about what they learned in those, those implicit bias videos and what they learned about themselves from the Harvard test um, and talk about those in smaller safe spaces. One thing that HR has done to support this work is to provide disaggregated data to committees so that they can monitor the makeup of their, of their applicant pools throughout the process. Last year, we used disaggregated data to identify recruitment sources that brought us um, traditionally underrepresented candidates. And this year we plan to examine that data with the goal of identifying racialized patterns, maybe where folks are getting eliminated in the process disproportionately. Um, so we're hoping to learn something this year. Also, we wanna monitor if we think the bias literacy training has been effective. We got good feedback about it when we offered the training, but it will be interesting this year to see, to measure a baseline against the candidates we hired last year um, to see if these efforts were effective. We hope to uh, develop a Canvas course training that, you, that would take the content from the training that we developed and implemented this year so that committees can take it throughout the academic year. The downside of that, and we're trying to figure out how to overcome this, is that it doesn't offer the opportunity for conversation and constructive dialogue around um, the implicit bias training portion. So that's something that we wanna revisit. And finally, we have, this is the first year we've implemented a new program called Spark Hire. Spark Hire is a one-way video conference system where search committees choose a few questions and then links are sent to the candidates and they can record their answer for those. So Spark Hire will be used to provide a more efficient means for conducting first round interviews. 
our goal was to include more candidates in the very first round. We had to figure out a way to make that easy for our search committees because time was such a barrier. Committees had to come together to participate in that first round and listen to so many candidates. So Spark Hire allows a more efficient system because back, I'm sorry, because the committee members can review those interviews on their own time. Also, the candidates can review or can record their answers at their own time and send them off. So we got a lot of positive feedback that that was really easy for folks. Um, candidates receive the link to the platform and are required to record their answers before a specific deadline. The platform allows the candidates to have some think time and to re-record their answers if they are unhappy with the way their first recording turned out. We believe in our office that this platform is beneficial to candidates and committees um, because of the convenience, but also that it allows a more accommodating method for candidates to have that first round. Stress can hinder a candidate's interview performance, and we hope that this platform allows them some time to think over their answers, respond in a manner without having a lot of faces across the table from you and um, causing some anxiety. So we're hoping that for any candidates maybe that are um, not neurotypical, that this would be a benefit to them. Does anybody have any questions about that so far? <clears throat> I knew I would be fast, huh? <laughs> Sorry, I was hoping to get to 10 minutes. <laughs> No, oh, that's great. It leaves room for a buffer for other uh, presenters as well, and then also room for great questions if anybody has any at this time. Oh, and Christina shared the link to how faculty hiring committees reproduce whiteness. This is a article that we circulate um, to all of our search committees before the training. It's if you are all not familiar with it, I encourage you to read it. It's it's very eye opening. That's great. Summer, we'll add that to the Google Drive of resources as well. Thank you. I appreciate everybody's time and interest. Thank you. Thanks, Summer. I think you're probably peeling off to to meet the demands of the rest of your day, yes? Yes, I am currently in our executive committee meeting. Um, oh, do you have a subscription to Spark Hire? Yes, we do have a subscription. I think we've got the unlimited package this year. Um, for any institutions out there that still use NeoGov, we found Spark Hire through NeoGov and they acted as a third party uh, to connect us to them. And there is ways to, I think, connect those two systems. Below our request. Sorry, I'm just trying to peek in the chat here. Um, so, so far, this is our, we're just getting started with Spark Hire. Our committees have loved it. We did receive one piece of feedback from a candidate that they did not like the process. I think they felt isolated by it. Um, but for the mo with the exception to that, particular candidate, I would say it's been fairly positive. Thank you, everybody. I just want to do a quick clarification, Claudine, the mm -hmm. requested questions that, oh, they're there. Those are some great questions. Let's, I'm going to take Christina, do you mind making sure that we get a copy of these questions? See if we can't build, see if there's some time after the presentations. If not, we'll uh, be able to loop back and respond to. Yes. 
after. Can you do that? Yes, I can save those and then um, have them available for uh, our drive. And then Sarah had asked a question for Summer as well. Yes, thanks, Sarah. We do pull that manually. Um, I think that as, as a college, one of our priorities has been to utilize NeoGov to its fullest extent. I think that is a really cool system that does some really great things, but the institution has not used those in the past. So we are hoping, we lost our talent acquisition and employee development manager this year. And one of, it was a shame because one of her priorities was to really leverage all of the capacity within that tool. Um, we're recruiting for a new talent acquisition manager and hoping that whoever is hired can continue that same energy to really dive into NeoGov and figure out what it can do. One thing that we really need to identify is connecting the applicant data with who is hired at the end. And hopefully there's some type of reporting in NeoGov that we can leverage for that. That's a big disconnect in our data right now is because uh, we're monitoring the applicant pools, but what the college hasn't done in the past is, is assess at the end, who are the folks we are hiring? Um, so that that's one report that we're hoping um, that NeoGov can help us with in the future. That's great. So yeah. Summer, I don't know if you saw or looking at the chat. Sarah says that's a great idea. Something uh, like Washington Tech will look into and share for finding good strategies. Uh, and I did receive a direct message with a question saying, have you seen any movement as far as an increase in the diversity of applicants either hired or have you seen a change in the bias impact by using Spark Hire? Mm -hmm. it's, too, it's too early to tell for that, I think. Um, again, besides the Spark Hire providing some opportunity to give those who are not neurotypical um, hopefully it serves as, as an accommodation <laughs> to them. What we're really hoping is that it will allow search committees to be open to a much broader first round candidate pool. I think those were smaller in the past just because people they didn't have the time to schedule out, you know, nine different um, first round phone conversations. So this allows for more flexibility, I believe. So I think that only grows our app, um, broadens that first round pool and that's that's a positive. We will also be tracking retention. Oh, Amy, I wish I could say yes to that. We are still trying to get our, we were just making headway in recruitment before retention became such mm -hmm. a hot topic issue mm -hmm. um, this last year. So I, I have to admit we're a little, little behind the ball there. A really important inquiry though, Amy, about the retention portion. I, as I'm looking at those questions above that uh, Claudine had submitted into the chat, they, they're dancing around that very issue is um, how do we not just recruit uh, diverse faculty into our college campuses, but ensure that they have opportunities to grow, um, that they are spaces that um, they can uh, feel a sense of belonging in, um, and that it doesn't become a revolving door for our diverse candidates that come through. So really important to be thinking about that as we move forward. Great questions. Anybody else have questions as we've got the amazing summer course for another four minutes or so? <laughs> it looks like you, uh, for lack of another term, sparked interest in the Spark Hire component wow. there, Summer. So I have a feeling that people will be reaching into you a little bit. Oh, that's wonderful. It was a big risk. It it was not cheap and we 
we're unsure if it would end up being something we could get uh, just that we could convince our search committees to implement and we started to get a little bit worried and then all it took was one one committee they agreed to uh, utilize it they told their friends and now we're getting a lot more buy-in which which is fantastic um, it's not benefiting us much on the staff side right now because our applicant pools just aren't big enough. Like I said, we're hoping to create more capacity within that first round, but we're only getting one or two applicants. So unfortunately, it hasn't um, hasn't really created opportunity for us on that side yet. Well, hopefully it'll grow. It sounds like it has the potential. Yes. Well, great summer. I think that we, I think that there are no other questions related to what you shared. Um, and I think we'll also share out your contact information. If you're open to people reaching into you, that would be Oh, fabulous. absolutely. Okay. Thank you for sharing your good work, the fabulous work that Highline's engaging in. I appreciate you. I'll speak on behalf of everyone, maybe, that we appreciate you. So thank you so very much. And we just uh, allow you to get back to your board meeting. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Have a great week. Great. Thanks, Summer. If memory serves me, and well, memory doesn't have to serve me. It's a reminder right in front of me there. Uh, we've got Elder Bancourt Lopez to share about the good work of Pierce and the most recent, I think recent, uh, cluster hiring process that they've realized there. And uh, if I remember correctly, too, Elder, you'll be speaking to some of the uh, sort of the more uh, broader aspects of that process that is growing at Pierce. So I'll go ahead and give that up to you. Thank you, Ha. Huh? Good morning, CTC Familia. Uh, my name is Ilder Betancur Lopez. First and foremost, I am the son of undocumented immigrants, uh, from one from Mexico and one from El Salvador, who journeyed north uh, to LA, where I was born. And then I continued that journey north, even further north, and now I'm here in Washington as I uh, have the opportunity to work for the students of Pierce College, uh, specifically in the Fort Silicon campus. But as some of you know, Pierce College is Pierce College. <laughs> we just happen to have a couple of sites. Um, I'm excited to um, share with you all um, Pierce College's approach uh, this year, which is new. Um, and I'm going to share a PowerPoint slide with you all. Do you all see the uh, presentation mode? Okay, great. I just want to say, first of all, that um, uh, I'm a former faculty member, used to be psychology uh, faculty in Arizona, Glendo Community College, part of the Maricopa Community College District, that monster <laughs> district. Um, and ever since then, uh, the recruitment and hiring of faculty of color has been my personal passion. And I've continued that work. Um, throughout my career in the community college system, which uh, includes, as I mentioned, Arizona, also California, and now Washington. Um, wherever I go, I find ways to uh, influence. Uh, so because this is a priority of mine, primarily because I remember what it was like to go through higher education and look for those faculty that look like me and how much uh, benefit and how I really owe those faculty members, um, part of the reason why I was able to get through higher education. Um, so I'll talk about today the new approach that we're taking at Pierce College. And I want to first uh, also say that um, I want to acknowledge uh, San Diego State University um, from which we modeled um, our approach. So we're having a focus on racial equity and, and faculty hiring. Um, and all of this is, I think, the, the, the bill, but really the approach here is just one piece of how we're trying to change um, the faculty experience at uh, Pierce College. Um, so of course, it starts with the hiring process, and I'll spend most of my presentation on talking about what we're doing here. But in addition, um, in our revamping of this, we are also looking at the first year faculty cohort experience, which is something that has been in existence at Pierce, but we're re revisiting it given uh, this new hiring uh, process. And then of course, the tenure process, uh, that historic uh, process in higher education, we're taking a look at that and it will be different for our new 
uh, cohort that we're bringing in. And I'll, I'll talk, talk briefly about that at the end. So like I said, I'm gonna focus primarily in the hiring uh, process. And um, I'm going to share a link on the chat. That'll take you to our landing page for Pierce College. And really what I'll share a bit, some screenshots from that site here in the presentation. Um, so we took what is called a cluster hire approach, meaning that we developed a theme for all faculty, uh, regardless of the discipline. So that before we even decided what disciplines we were going to uh, hire this year, we were thinking, we first thought, okay, through what theme are we bringing faculty? And of course, for me and for uh, Pierce College in general, and like uh, all higher education institutions, we acknowledge that we have a problem um, helping our black and brown students. It's just been decades worth of data, right? That's not even the question. Um, and so how do we address that? And we address it by specifically calling it out. And instead of taking a deficit approach, we took a, how do we help our students reach excellence? So our theme with this cluster hire is black and brown student excellence. We're hiring faculty who will help and be a part of this process of um, helping us and helping our students reach that excellence, helping our black and brown students specifically. And so taking that cluster hire approach um, around that lets candidates know that that's what the focus is, that um, this is what Pierce is about. This is what, um, aside from your content knowledge, we really want you to focus on black and brown students and black and brown student excellence. And so uh, the other reason why it's called the cluster hire is because then it creates a community around that theme. Uh, as new faculty come in, uh, specifically, we were looking at 16 here at Pierce. As uh, new faculty come in, there's a community already around that. that even though they're all in different disciplines, um, there's this common thread that they're all working towards black and brown student excellence. And so um, that's the, the link I shared in the chat and I'll share some, some screenshots in a bit. But then that also starts to um, uh, dictate how our job description will look like. So just a couple of things from the, from the landing page. I won't read through uh, the uh, piece here, but here we highlight, um, again, the black and brown student excellence piece, how we strive to be an anti-racist institution. Uh, we talk a bit about our black and brown students, empowering students, um, cultivating self-efficacy. Um, we also uh, uh, allude to the Washington bill, SB 5194. Um, and encouraging applicants to join our journey to really uh, put first our black and brown students. As we scroll down that website, uh, we talk about candidates here and what we're asking candidates to do. And here I'll, I'll talk about the, the list of four here. So candidates are asked that in order to be considered, we are desiring candidates who have two or more of the following characteristics. So this is really what goes in the job description. And this is a requirement of all candidates when they submit their application is that they address two, at least two of these. So we want candidates who have experience or has demonstrated commitment to teaching, mentoring, and or engaging in services for black and brown students, uh, has demonstrated knowledge of barriers for black and brown students and experience in addressing disproportionate impact at an institution. Three, has experience in or has demonstrated commitment in facilitating black and brown students navigating a higher education institution. And four, has experience or demonstrated commitment to integrating elements of culturally relevant and inclusive pedagogy. Um, I also wanna highlight that um, uh, while yes, we, we, we um, write the experience part there, we also wanted to include uh, that they have demonstrated commitment, right? So we know people are in different journeys um, or find themselves in different parts of that journey uh, to helping black and brown students. Some may be more at the intro level. And so as long as they're able to demonstrate the commitment um, in their writing, we look for that. Um, and one thing that we did as well is um, train uh, deans um, in the framework of the equality versus equity model. So as they read through these answers submitted by candidates, um, 
to really pinpoint when are individuals taking an equality model, right? I, 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 I like to teach, serve all students, which is great, but that's not gonna help us, right? The equality model has not been a benefit for forever in higher education. And instead, when do they talk about specifically, this is what I do with my black and brown students, or this is what I would do with black and brown students. In addition, if you go to the landing page, you'll notice that we have several uh, prof tech areas that we're hiring. Oftentimes we get applicants directly from industry. So in those uh, particular job descriptions, we noted, we noted that, we acknowledge that, and we ask that, because um, this is referring to students, just how in their industry they have been or are committed to uh, black and black and brown uh, employees, uh, you know, whatever is appropriate within their industry as well. So now that we have, again, the theme around the cluster hire, we determine, all right, who, who what positions are we, gonna, are we gonna go forward with? Um, and this was a, a collective conversation. Well, let me talk about the process here. So first, the deans identified faculty needs in their areas, right? Deans being the most um, knowledgeable about any gaps, um, any needs that may uh, exist in their um, academic areas, professional tech areas. Once that is identified, once we have a, a preliminary list, we scored five variables for each of those needs that were identified. Um, and I'll share with you the five variables here. Um, the first is within that area, let's say it's English, what percent, uh, um, what is the success rate of the BIPOC students, right? And so here we rank if the percent is lower, that means that there's a high need there, right? And so we, pr we prioritize that. Then the percent of BIPOC student enrollment in that particular area, right? So if, if the enrollment of BIPOC students are, is high there, again, we're prioritizing there because that's where our BIPOC students are going and enrolling. The percent, the current percent of BIPOC faculty um, in that discipline, again, if it was low, that means that we really need to uh, emph emphasize the need there because we want to diversify that particular area. And then two additional, um, um, variables were uh, the um, full-time to uh, part-time ratio, right? How many uh, uh, adjunct faculty are teaching the classes there in that particular discipline? And then of course, total enrollment as an indicator of demand. We weighed these out, uh, came up with a score um, for each of the um, requested um, positions, did a quantitative ranking at this point, but we didn't stop there. We had a discussion as dean, as deans, uh, vice presidents, and then did the qualitative piece, right? So that, because there's always qualitative pieces that can't be captured by the data. And that's how we ultimately came up um, with the 16 positions that if you're in the landing page, you'll notice that we decided to move forward with. Um, as I mentioned, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what happens next, right? So as it was mentioned earlier, it's great that we're hiring. Of course, it's, it's really great, but then, but then what, right? What, is, what about that retention piece? So our first year faculty cohort experience traditionally has been a great way for faculty to learn about peers, to learn about the tenure process um, and connect, or connect with others at the college, which is great in and of itself. Um, and now we're gonna expand that and really refocus on the black and brown student excellence. So we're developing a year long curriculum where in fall, we're gonna focus on teaching and learning to black and brown students. In the winter, we're gonna focus on student advising specifically to black and brown students. And then in the spring, we're gonna focus on shared governance. Um, and how do we, how do you, as a talk to faculty, new faculty, what is their agency? Cause they have a lot of agency within the institution. Um, help them learn the shared governance uh, approach at Pierce so that they can use that to make the institution better for black and brown students. Again, time um, that opportunity um, to help our students. And we said, hey, we, we want you to help us with black and brown student excellence. Um, 
And then not just have it be a job description thing, but really it's it's everything going forward in your career here at Pierce College. And that's what the, the first year faculty cohort experience will revolve around. Um, in addition, tied to that then is the tenure process, right? Again, it's this uh, great effort. <laughs> I mean, great by like immense, this immense effort that our faculty are asked to, um, to go through uh, in three years. Um, it would not be, um, it would be a bad idea to hire them with the black and brown student excellence piece and then the tenure process have nothing to do with that, right? Um, so just, just on principle of hiring for this piece, we uh, are uh, recreating the tenure process so that it focuses on that. But more importantly for me is that, yes, we're hiring for that, but if the tenure process just is changed to reflect that, that's gonna have huge implications for the institution. I um, mean, it really will demonstrate our commitment um, to really eradicating the, the issues that we have created for black and brown students. Um, I'm also happy to say that our union is in support of this. Um, and so we're gonna to begin to talk about, well, we have already started talking about what the new tenure process will look like. Um, and so that way, these last two pieces are um, uh, work, simultaneously because as as faculty go through the first year faculty cohort naturally they'll also be talking about their own tenure process as well finally i want to say um so we're in the process already of hiring um have ha, i as vi vice president have had the opportunity now to interview a couple of finalists and um, here's where the emotional piece comes in it is amazing uh, so having now interviewed faculty for, I have to do the math, uh, or faculty applicants for almost 12 years in my career, um, it is amazing to have finalists who themselves are black and brown and who themselves bring their black and brown excellence. And then it's amazing to, in some cases, only interview black and brown finalists for a given position in positions where historically that you have institutions have had difficulty even getting one black and brown candidate through. It really is amazing and an emotional experience for me as well. So with that, I will stop and I'll take any questions. I think I see Yvonne's hand. No, no, I was just I was just saying thank you, uh, and this thank you for sharing the focus on Black and Brown student excellence. I think as we continue to move towards with uh, policy five one nine four, there is over sort of the community colleges in general, you know how to move in the direction in which you all have. And I just wanna thank you for sharing that with us. It gives me um, a continue just a lot more, I wouldn't say maybe a lot more to think about, but you know, just a lot more uh, ways to continue to think about strategizing. How do we bring this bill to life um, in a way that colleges have said that they are committed to this, right? Like. I really believe the legislature helped us move in the direction of what we say we're committed to. And then now it's operationalizing. And so just thank you. I just to, uh, um, I can go to your website and do a little bit more due diligence and then I can still hear you. And that can help me just have a better understanding. So I just appreciate that work and what you shared with us today. Thank you. Any other comments or questions for Elder have him here with us? Can we have Elder's um, contact information or can we send him our contact information? I would just like. You can definitely contact me. I'm putting my uh, email on the chat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> and we'll have this uh, PowerPoint deck 
uh, with his contact information on the Google Drive as well. So you can access that. And Ilder, if you're open to sharing uh, your slides as well, that would be fabulous. Of course. Of course. I appreciate the really clear approach that uh, your team took in looking at where are those areas that measured by BIPOC student success and low enrollments um, and really being really clear about where that gap is, where that work needs to be done. Um, and then also leaving room for discussion and bringing in those aspects that may not be uh, reflected within the data. So appreciate that approach so very much. It, it accounts for sort of that baseline you can work with and be able to build that, um, uh, the, the importance of um, amplifying those areas on, on your campus and being very explicit. I think you said it at the very beginning. We just said it out loud over and over again. We're here to serve our black and brown students. We haven't been doing it very well for, for decades upon decades and upon decades. And we have such clear evidence to show that and that it's time to do differently. So I appreciate that very much, Elder. I see a question came up from Amy. Hi, Amy from Olympic. What has been the candidate feedback regarding your new process? Thanks for the question, Amy. We haven't had a systemic um, way of reaching out to candidates to um, ask for feedback. I will say though that um, in those final um, uh, interviews that I've been involved in, I've heard candidates say that that is the reason they're applying to peers uh, because of that deliberate um, approach that we're taking. And just having conversations as to what that means to them personally um, and how they envision and also what it means to me, they've asked me. And then um, thinking about what's possible um, going forward here at Pierce um, with um, the new ways in which we can serve black and brown students. Mm -hmm. And I think to the, the aspect of looking beyond the higher, right? How do we create that environment, those processes, like the tenure process? What needs to shift there so that you're, you're creating an environment that supports um, these candidates as they move through? Yep. Incredible work at Pierce Elder. Thank you so much for sharing it Thank with you. this group. Thank you. Anybody else have something? I know I have a feeling that people will be reaching into you, Elder, and we'll make sure to share your uh, materials out with the group as well. Of course. We'll be watching. This will be this will be great to see. Okay, so with that, I think what I'll do is go ahead, Bonnie, if you don't mind coming on a couple of minutes early and you've got a buffer of time, if you'd like as well, uh, to go ahead and share the good work coming out of Spokane Falls. No problem, I'd be happy to jump in. So um, hello everyone, um, I am uh, Bonnie and I'm the Visual and Performing Arts Dean here at Spokane Falls Community College. Uh, but I have been involved in our search advocates program since the beginning and uh, probably know the program the best. So um, that's why I was asked to present here. Uh, my pronouns are she, uh, ella, I speak Spanish, and I'm from Spokane Falls Community College, which um, many of you know is on the traditional lands of the Spokane tribe. Our district, we're part of a district, and our district actually includes a region that includes the homelands of the Confederate tribes of Col the Colville Reservation and the Kalispell tribe. So um, we've got a lot of tribal folks here. Um, if you will go to the next slide, I wanna read a quote to you because it's pertinent to what we are going to be, um, we are going to be talking about here in just a minute. So can we get the next slide? All right. So um, this quote here is one of our favorites and um, very pertinent. We're gonna show you some of our dirty laundry on the next slide where we were doing the best we could, but not great. Um, and we've been working on um, now that we know better, doing better. So I just wanted to give that introduction to um, our following slide. 
So go ahead and look at the next slide. So back in 2015, our HR department did a presentation to the administrators showing us this data, along with many other slides that are similar. I, I picked the faculty slide because it was the worst. And when we looked at this, what you're looking at is the percentage of people of color in each stage of our process. And the red bar at the beginning is the percentage that is available in our labor pool. Um, so about 16% of our labor pool is considered to be BIPOC. And then the first blue bar you see, it actually um, is higher than that, the amount of people that we, we have applying to CCS, which is great. That tells us that we're doing a good job recruiting um, people of color. But from there, the story gets a lot worse. Um, right, after minimum calls, actually, it went up, which is great. But once we started to screen, um, yeah, there starts to be this stair step thing that we really were uh, not pleased to see. Um, even before we saw the candidates, you can see even after the minimum qualifications screen, um, the, the percentage of candidates of color started to drop. And then um, when our college president saw this, she at the time we had a president that was very much like, let's take action right now. So she um, tasked a subcommittee of our diversity, equity, and global awareness committee to look into some sort of training uh, that we could give, maybe to have an equity advocate on each search. And we looked around and found online, we found the program at Oregon State University led by Ann Gillies. You might have heard of it. She's been in the, um, the Chronicle of Higher Education with her program. Um, we saw the description of her program online. That was our introduction. And we thought it looked like exactly what we were trying to do. Uh, so rather than reinvent the wheel, we invited her in 2015 to, 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 to do a training on our campus and also on the campus of Spokane Community College, our sister college in the district. We had about 35 to 40 participants in each. And our president insisted that all deans and directors should take this training too. So right away, the people that often screen um, those the, that chair the screening committees got to be in the training. And she also said, from this point forward, every single search committee that we have on this campus will include a search advocate, um, which was tough, maybe, maybe a pretty rough start for us uh, to launch before we were really ready. But what's interesting is the, pres the person who was president at our sister campus did not do this. And it was kind of lucky as it turned out because it provided sort of a control group um, to see a camp one campus was using search advocates, the other one was not. And after the first three years of our program, our HR gathered some data. And that's what you're gonna see on the next slide here. So what you see on this slide is the percentage of BIPOC hired at the two campuses over the next three years, not just making it through the whole process, but being hired. Um, we had already seen at this point that the dialogues around the table at our screening committees had really begun to transform. But we were also happy to see that the numbers showed that our program was starting to impact the percentage of BIPOC that we were hiring. The blue line is our campus, SCC. That's the campus that was using search advocates in every search. The yellow campus is our sister campus, uh, SCC, whose screening committees did not include search advocates. And you'll see that the percentage of candidates of color um, increased by quite a lot during this period whereas the gains at SEC were pretty minimal. Now, I am happy to report that when the, the current president at SEC saw this data in 2019, he realized, oh, we need to get into the, we need to get with the program quite literally. So he immediately announced that by January of the next year, um, they would require it on every, um, on every screening committee, just like we were. And um, over the course of our history with this program, we now have 404 employees uh, who have done our training. 332 of those are still employed. 101 of those are at our campus and SCC has now passed us with 116. And then there's 115 from the district, Head Start, Foundation that are not actually at one of our campuses. 
And we have encouraged anyone and everyone who's interested in the training to do it, whether or not they're planning to serve as a search advocate, uh, because we believe that this uh, information is really important to transform our hiring culture. So um, we have many people that have taken the training and that's all they've ever done. But the next time they serve on a screening committee, then that is in their heads as well. And in fact, this last summer, I had the pleasure of, of chairing a screening committee in which every member of the committee plus our search advocate, plus me, had taken the training. And that was beautiful because everyone exactly understood what we were trying to do. So for those of you who are not familiar with the program, let's go on to talk about um, what is a search advocate. Um, a search advocate is a non-voting member, at least on our campus, of the screening committee who's been trained in the practices to interrupt bias and enhance equity and inclusion during the hiring process. They serve as a partner and a resource to the committee assisting them to achieve their goal of conducting a fair, equitable, and inclusive search. So that's our sort of definition of what a search advocate is. And if you'll see on the next slide, um, the search advocate really participates in the entire process, ideally, from the development of the job bulletin, even before it posts, all the way through the integration of your hire into our campus life. That's our ideal. And I can't say that we started with perfect um, uh, completion of our ideal. And we're still working on it, frankly. We, every year that we do this, we try to improve um, how we're doing this. Um, and so this person attends all meetings. They receive access to all application materials. They participate in every conversation, including the creation of the tools for the search, the screening instrument, the interview questions, the reference check questions. Um, and since our uh, president launched immediately, we sort of built the plane while we were flying. And each year we've kind of continued to improve one more um, you know, part of the program. So let's talk about what our search advocate role is during this entire process. Um, quite simply on the next slide, we summarize the role is simply to enhance uh, validity, equity and diversity in our searches. How do they enhance the validity of the search? They assist the committee to forward the very best candidates for the position and enhance the equity by assisting the committee to run a fair selection process in which selection is based solely on the factors related to job performance. Uh, we wanna enhance the diversity of our searches to assist the committee to decrease biases and barriers that have historically impeded the success of our minoritized populations. So that sounds pretty nice. Um, we're gonna talk about how they do this, what actual actions they take on the next slide, break down their role a little bit. One of the important things is that they are really not focused at all on the content. They're not focused on who is applying and whether they're well qualified or not qualified. They don't, they're really not paid to, to have, they're not paid at all, they're volunteers, but they're not volunteered to have opinions about who's a better candidate. They're really just watching the process. And they're the only person there that's only watching the process that allows them to maintain some distance and keep themselves into getting sucked in, right? Which gives them a better view on what we're doing. So we always uh, suggest that search advocates should only serve on committees outside their department for that reason. Um, otherwise they will be have the same bias blind spots that everyone else has. Um, their role during all discussions is to just stay focused on the process so they can test the thinking of the committee members or help the committee members test their own thinking and ask those questions. They're also trained on some of the best practices in hiring that help to mitigate bias, both structural and cognitive bias. And obviously, they can best do this by working with the chair of the committee, who's the one that's sort of directing how the process goes. So that's a pretty important relationship, that relationship between the search advocate chair and uh, the search advocate and the committee chair. Um, we really define it as a, a partnership between them, right? They're mutually supportive roles and it functions best when each one um, respects the other and has an open and trusting communication uh, relationship. Our language around the search advocate role does not include words like to enforce, to ensure. Um, they're not the equity police, we're fond of saying. They're really our partner to help us reach our own goals. And that's really important so that the committee remains open uh, to the search advocates' questions and suggestions 
And we've actually developed a pretty detailed document that outlines this role um, by stages, what the, so that both can really be expecting the same thing in every stage of the process. And that's helped smooth those relationships as well. So just to talk a quick bit about the, um, the uh, workshop agenda and what we try to accomplish during our workshop when we train our search advocates. Um, this is actually just taken straight from the training. We put up the agenda at the beginning of the training. So you see, um, if you've taken the training from Oregon State University, you'll recognize many of these points because this is based on their training. Um, obviously, one important point is helping participants understand the difference between equity and equality, between disparate treatment, disparate impact, and how that structural training, uh, structural bias creeps into our system and does produce disparate impact if we're not watching out for it and interrupting it. Another significant part is obviously about unconscious bias or implicit bias is another name for that which includes both uh, cognitive shortcuts, cognitive biases, and structural bias, um, and some strategies at every stage to sort of interrupt that. But you will see some different things that we've added to the training there as well, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, the next slide shows you know, what we hope our search advocates will be able to do at the end of the workshop. We hope that they'll be able to describe their own role or the role of the search advocate on a committee. Um, you know, their little elevator speech of, of what a search advocate does, um, really understand and give um, definitions of what we mean by equity, diversity, inclusion, um, explain how cognitive biases and structural biases work together, um, and identify the typical ways that searches often fail to mitigate bias, um, and also how power dynamics can interfere. Um, we uh, want them to be able to develop a screening criteria rubric that will increase inclusion and reduce bias. And that rubric we affectionately call the matrix. You'll hear a little bit more about that later. It has nothing to do with pills of any color. Um, and uh, they are trained on practices that we believe really increase inclusion, reduce bias, mitigate power dynamics at every stage. So um, unfortunately, well, let me back up. The first five years of our program, we had Ann Gillies come to our campus and give her training. Um, the way we were forced to get brave and develop our own training is one year we contacted her to schedule her visit and she was not available. She's, she's become much in demand. And so we thought, okay, we're gonna have to do this ourselves. So we gathered our courage, we gathered a team, that was important. None of us felt brave enough to do it by ourselves, but in a team. And we spent the whole su first summer of the pandemic adapting the training for our own purposes. Uh, we, yes, we had a lot of meetings on somebody's back patio, um, by the way, so that we could all have our fresh air. Um, we have modified it. We've added some content. Um, the content about group and power dynamics was something that we felt was important to add. We also added research on how our own chronotypes can impact our cognition and decision making at different times of the day. Um, so we, we've d definitely added some content. And then the other thing was we realized as we watched the pandemic continue to spread throughout that summer, we started to realize, well, this training is not going to be in person. It's going to be via Zoom. And the training at our campus had always been a full day training. That just filled us with horror to think about giving a training for eight hours on Zoom. We didn't know if it could actually be done in a way that would be successful. Uh, but we took on the challenge and did a lot of work to make sure uh, the training was super interactive. So we really um, divided the lecture portion into much shorter sections, and then we alternated that um, presentation of material with the active involvement of participants. Uh, very important to this is our breakout rooms. They are not just thrown in there to make sure people aren't asleep. They're very intentionally planned. Um, we actually have them start to work with their own group within the first 15 minutes of the training. They introduce themselves, they meet each other because they're gonna be seeing each other all day long. And they're gonna be given actual difficult tasks to accomplish in their groups. Um, the, we, we structure the uh, activities in their breakout rooms so they have a really clear task that they have to share back with the rest of the group. And by the end of the day, we found that those groups are, are very connected. They're developed some team pride and, you know, uh, they're bragging in the chat. Group number three is the best, you know, things like that. 
Um, we also encourage them to share the chat to just interact and have fun together during the day. Um, we use music on the breaks to keep things lively. Um, we've developed polls in sort of a quiz show format just to liven things up and also to give us a read on how well the participants are understanding the, con uh, the content. We've actually changed the training based on that feedback in a couple of sections. And our latest edition, we've added little reader theater um, sketches. We rename ourselves on the Zoom screen to be screen, uh, screening committee chair or screening committee member one or search advocate. And then we use these sketches in sort of a comic way to show how the process can go awry. We show some pretty bad behavior on the part of the committee and then sh show how the search advocate can actually redirect um, that uh, conversation. So it makes it fun and interesting. And um, the, the other th big thing that we teach on the next slide, as I said, is the matrix. Um, this is a simple picture of what the matrix looks like, but I'm gonna go through each column here and talk about how we fill it in. We just fill out the comp uh, qualification on the job bulletin, whether it's required or preferred. The really important um, columns here are What's the relationship to the job? Why do they need to have this? Or what parts of the job can they not do if they don't have this? Um, and how do we know when we see it? What does that mean? Um, what, what would we see in each stage of the process if they had that qualification or if they had it in a larger quantity than somebody else? And we really ask at each stage, is this a transferable skill that they might have acquired in a different context? Um, and we focus in specifically on which stages it's best to assess because obviously some things cannot be assessed on paper very well, or at least not very accurately. Some things really are better assessed in a reference check. Um, and then what priority? Is this a really important qualification um, compared to the other ones, or is this less important? So let's walk through those quickly. I don't want to spend too much more time here um, because I don't think I have too much more time. Um, but the relationship to the job is something that most people just never really think about or certainly don't talk about with the rest of the committee is how, how, why do they need this? And what parts of their job require it? What parts would be hard to do? And this last part is the qualification that we had listed actually a proxy for a set of skills. And if so, how can we state those skills directly rather than using a proxy? And I'll give you an example. Um, our, our position descriptions often used to have, well, they must have this on their resume. They, they must have done you know, three years of teaching. We don't want to get a green teacher. We want someone that's experienced and good. Well, we had to break down, does experience automatically equal good? How many of you have had a teacher that's been in the field for 20 years and it's not necessarily good? So we, we pointed out that that is not a one-for-one -one ratio. So then we said, well, if we're actually looking for someone that's an effective teacher, um, then what would that look like? And we've really redirected our conversations and our, um, and our requirements um, based on that conversation. The next one, um, is it transferable? Is this a portable skill? Um, we've hired people directly from industry that have never taught, but we see teaching skills in their job. Um, they are the person in the office that learns the software first and teaches it to everyone else, or they're the ones that are constantly seeking out workshops or, um, you know, camps where they can teach these skills um, or whatever. So we definitely um, ask our committees to think about this. Next, we also ask, and this is probably the most difficult part, is what would indicate to us that this candidate meets the competency we're looking for? How would they demonstrate it? And once we fill in the grid with a few things, we say, well, is there any other ways? And then once we add a few more things, we say, well, what else? Because we really wanna make sure we've thoroughly thought through all the possible ways this could present because different candidates are gonna have different ways of showing us that they have this. So we're not just looking for the traditional path to demonstrate this. We're really looking at all the different ways. Um, and then we ask ourselves, okay, can we think of someone who would actually be good at this job, but who wouldn't meet this criteria? Because often you accidentally exclude people not really thinking about all the possibilities out there. So that's the, the heart of the matrix right there. And um, the other part of this is when should we do this? When should we fill out the matrix? When should we establish this much detail in our criteria? Um, 
at what stage can we um, really rule out somebody and say, no, they don't have it. I have been on many screening committees where during the very first stage, the screening, people say, well, they didn't mention this, so clearly they don't have it. Well, I've been through searches where I didn't know if they had the skills until reference checks. Um, so you, you got to really ask yourself, can we, do we have just unknown information? Should we keep digging, keep trying to find out more? Or at this point, do we have enough evidence to say we can tell they don't have this qualification? So that's the um, which stage to assess. And then the last, of course, is how important is it compared to the others? And how important is it to have extra strength in this? Um, it should, if it's a preferred qualification, help someone to actually do better on the job. So that's another question to ask is, well, do we just prefer this because we prefer it? Or is it actually going to, what, what relevance does it have to have this, right? Um, so that's another way. And I'm wrapping up here. Um, I wanted to let you know that this has been a, a, a real big team effort. Oh, one more thing here. Yes, this slide. One of the things we did is we incorporated a statement at the beginning of every single position that we post outwardly to um, show folks what they're getting into. We really wanted to tell them what kind of campus we are, who we serve, um, you know, what, what we are. And so we developed this one at our campus um, to just say, look, this is why you would want to work here is because we are, you know, a campus near the Spokane River, near the urban center of Spokane, high quality of life and all of that, but then really make sure they know we pride ourselves on having these connections to our communities, right? We, we are on the ancestral home of the Spokane tribe. We serve Fairchild Air Force Base. We serve rural communities. Um, we serve tribal students. Um, and then what we, what we try to be, right? Our idealized self. We wanna be an educational leader, responsive community partner, um, offer the highest quality and um, embrace diversity, promote equity and foster global awareness. What's really interesting is once we started posting this, um, this was developed, by the way, before we had a land acknowledgement um, at our district. We um, things at the district sometimes move kind of slowly, but our um, we just take advantage of the things we have control over at our college to to push things through. And then what followed, of course, was a land acknowledgement uh, statement from the whole district eventually. But this virtually acted as a land acknowledgement to um, candidates out there who were looking for this. I spoke with a recent hire that came in this summer, she had worked in Idaho, uh, in Coeur d'Alene actually, just half an hour away from us, and had found it to be a very unpleasant person, uh, experience as a person with indigenous roots. And uh, she, when she saw this opening at Spokane, she's like, eh, I'm not sure I wanna work at Spokane, it's awful close to Idaho, it might be sort of the same thing. And she looked at the, uh, the position description and read this and she thought, oh, no, this is a very different attitude. I will apply for this. So this was the piece that actually convinced her that she could apply here and she's really found it to be a wonderful experience um, and is glad she did. So um, the last slide I have here is just who is on the team. This has not been an effort, like I said, done in isolation. Um, I've been in, um, involved in the process th since the very beginning, since our college led the way, and I was um, the chair of the committee that looked into this at the very beginning, uh, the subcommittee on our diversity, equity, and global awareness committee. But now you can see we've got involvement from both campuses. Um, Guillermo Espinosa from SCC, he's their director of student success. We just um, started Angela Rasmussen, who's English faculty. Um, Mackie Snyder is now working with us in our human resources office. Grace Leaf, who used to be in human resources and now our acting CIO, has helped um, to institutionalize it better in her sectors. And Lori Hunt, who is now our active pro acting provost. So we've really um, in expanded the team and this is part of our efforts to institutionalize this. We did not want this to be um, dependent on one person. and. Rather than say, if one of us gets hit by a bus, I like to say, if one of us wins the lottery and goes on to pursue other uh, beautiful missions, um, then the program will continue on. And even if we change presidents at this point, um, change vice presidents, change um, uh, chancellor, uh, we hope that this program is embedded enough that it will continue and that folks have this mindset now really um, across the culture of, of our community college. So. That's it from me, and I am certainly um, available to answer questions. 
um, you are welcome to contact me if you have more questions about our program. I've actually met with folks from all over the country who are trying to start their own program on their campus and going through growing pains and trying to learn from our mistakes. With, so that's lovely. We don't want people to go through any more uh, than they have to uh, as they work out the kinks. But we've been very pleased with the conversations that people are having. Um, one of the searches I just um, finished, wrapped up, um, our search advocate said, um, this committee made it so easy because you're all very equity minded. And I love to hear that because it's no longer coming from one person on the committee or being imposed by leadership. It's just really starting to embed itself in our ways of being. So thank you. Any questions? I'm going to put in the chat, I don't know if this will work, but I'm going to try to see if you can open our charge. Um, this is the search advocates charge on every committee, um, and they use this to sort of explain to committees what they are doing there, what their point is, what they're supposed to be doing, and um, kind of keeps everybody clear um, and why we have search advocates. So they use this tool, um, they can hand it out at their committee meetings or go over it with their in their first meeting um, as a way to help everyone on the committee really understand um, what their mission is. Okay, so Krista asks if we'll be offering the training for others to sign up like we have in the past. Yes, we have been offering it twice a year now. And after, I think it was starting with the second one, we opened it up to other um, colleges to join in. Uh, um, we've had folks join in from Minnesota and all, all, certainly all around Washington State um, and some other places. Um, and some groups send a group. Uh, some colleges send a group of people um, so that they can have a group at their campus that really understands what this is about and can start things on their campuses. Our next one that we'll be offering will be in the fall. Um, I will say that uh, Cascadia has contacted us um, to offer one for them. And another college is uh, in the spring and another college has contacted us to do one in the summer for them. Um, so we have done that a few times, as well as just opening up um, the training that we do for our campuses. That is great. I'm glad Krista brought that up. I know state board members, uh, several members of our DEI committee team, as well as HR staff attended a training that you put on, Bonnie, uh, during COVID, I believe it was too. Yes. Um, I think we also invited you and I, I want to say it was Grace. Yes. Who came, and Grace. came and represented your work to the uh, hiring director line yes. at the state board as well. So just really incredible work that you've done. And I, I keep thinking about uh, the capacity where well, you had a sort of ran a miniature pilot program there with comparative uh, research with your your uh, South or I'm sorry, Spokane Community College. Yeah. Right? So you saw the differences there in that way, but also that uh, it's grown. The capacity of this this work has grown, not just um, across the campus campuses, but across the individual interview committee tables, right? There's, there's something about not having to be the lonely only search yeah. advocate sitting at the table, having to be the one tasked with bringing up the and, and, and intervening. Um, so to hear that an entire table of interview uh, team uh, has been trained and is is growing in their equity work and their equity mindedness in this way is is really powerful. So I appreciate you sharing that. Any other questions at all for Bonnie? We I know it's it's reminded me of some of the good work that we've started at our own agency and what we could do to continue moving in the direction that you've been moving. I'm also thinking about the different components and approaches from the three colleges that were shared today and what are those areas um, in each of them right that have drawn your attention where Pierce sort of really dialed in really tightly quantitatively and then allowed room for the qualitative aspect and and thinking through their retention process and how to embed that within their tenure process thinking about how search advocacy can be grown in a way that interview committees can be full of individuals who are thinking in this way and not afraid to intervene and to really pause the process 
just just to stop and pause the process and have the conversation before moving forward. Uh, and then I think highlights piece around spark hire, right? Incorporating a piece of that as they're beginning their their work at Highline. Just want to reintroduce each each of those components as as colleges are thinking about how to tailor their own faculty diversity program. Um, and I think Pierce alluded to it too, um, the piece around the funds that came through for the faculty conversions, tenure track faculty conversions. And so uh, how the, the particular faculty diversity program that you'll be embedding in the DEI strategic plans can help to inform those hires. Bonnie's got to run, thank you forever. That was fabulous. And I'm just gonna leave the last 30 seconds to allow for a state board EDI team. Julie, anyone else who'd just like to pop in? No, thumbs up from Julie. Yep, thumbs up. I hope, uh, I hope the information was helpful to a lot of folks in the room just for different ideas, you know, just for, for brainstorming and ways to think about uh, how you can implement some things on campus or enhance some things on campus. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thank you everybody for being here. Hopefully we we're able to help to fill some gaps. If you have any other questions or uh, would like some one-on-one -on -one time guidance, anything like that, we're here. Yes.